Good afternoon, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I'm Ramal Mustafa, the director of Lawrence National Center for Policy and Management at Ivy Business School. On behalf of the center, the Ivy Alumni Network, Ottawa Chapter, and the Ivy Academy, a warm welcome to you to this special live stream event. Today's conversation is part of a series of dialogues we hope to host on issues that are important to our Ivy community and more generally to Canada. Our panel today will analyze the implications of the US election results for Canada and how it will impact Canadian businesses, policy decisions, and trading relationships. Further, the panel will consider these issues through the lens of COVID-19, making pre-existing challenges related to enhancing Canadian competitive advantage and securing our nation's long-term prosperity even more urgent to address. These themes are central to the work of the Lawrence National Centre. We advocate for sound policy to improve Canada's national competitiveness with a focus on the significant challenges the country faces around digital trade and supporting infrastructure. Canada is a leader on so many fronts, strong institutions, solid financial markets, and robust democratic values, just to name a few. But it goes without saying that there is quite a bit of work to do in unlocking Canadian competitive advantage in the global economy. Today, we are joined by a truly distinguished set of panelists who will offer their incisive perspectives from their vantage point. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Perrin Beatty, PCOC, President and CEO of the 200,000 member Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Previously, Perrin held the same role at Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. And during his 21 years in parliament, he served as minister in seven different portfolios. Perrin is a member of the Lawrence National Center's Advisory Council. Welcome, Perrin. Also with us today is Sandra Pupatello. Sandra is the president of Canadian International Avenues. She served as an Ontario cabinet minister for eight years, six of those years as the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. She was a member of the Ontario legislature for 16 years. Sandra is on the board of the Pearson Centre, as well as the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Welcome, Sandra. We're also very fortunate to have Mark Werner, principal of MAAW Law and a leading expert in international competition and trade. Mark has led the government of Ontario's legal team in relation to restructuring of GM and Chrysler, advising a multinational pharmaceutical company on distributing its HIV drugs globally, and leading a team of foreign lawyers to draft framework for competition law for post apartheid South Africa. Welcome, Mark. Now, who better to moderate this panel discussion than well, Paul Wells? Paul is a senior writer at McLean's Magazine, award-winning author, has covered eight federal elections, and is a fellow of the Lawrence National Center. Welcome, Paul. We have a full agenda ahead of us, so without any further ado, Paul, over to you. Thanks very much, Ramel, and uh, thanks to our panelists. I was delighted when I heard uh, who we had managed to wrangle for this conversation, and we're grateful to them all for joining. And thanks to the uh, quite considerable number of people watching us at home. Uh, I know you all are busy, and you've got a lot of sort of online offer uh, for your time, and uh, we're grateful that you've decided to spend some of that time with us. Um, this today's panel kicks off some long term conversations that we hope to be having at the Lawrence National Center about improving Canadian competitiveness about the uh, environment within which uh, those decisions are made. And it just seemed like an obvious time to kick off those conversations, given what is finally happening in the United States. So it looks like Joe Biden is going to be the next president. And there is some opportunity for Canada to to um, move out of the 
defensive crouch that we've been in for four years, uh, um, given the the uh, nature of the uh, uh, what's now seems likely to be the outgoing administration. One hesitates to be definitive, but anyway, I think I think you get my drift. And so let's start by by talking about that. We're going to we're going to today's conversation will be in three segments. We're going to talk about Canada-U.S. relations. We're going to talk about Canada in the world, and then we're going to talk about um, what actions Canadian uh, firms and uh, governments can take uh, to improve Canada's economic success and its competitiveness within the context that we're going to discuss in the first two segments. So first on Canada-U.S. relations. And I guess we'll start uh, with Perrin Beattie. Perrin, um, uh, what do you think it means that we now have a new president? What what uh, opportunities does that open in Canada-U.S. Uh, commercial relations, and uh, what 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 uh, limits or caveats would you would would you add to that diagnosis? Well, Paul, let's let's start with the good news, and that's that it's a return to relative normalcy, uh, not to the way it was uh, before Trump, not to the days of Ronald Reagan, for example, but to relative normalcy where. Canadian business people won't have to get up in the morning and check their Twitter feed first thing to see if they're subject to a trade action. Uh, that's good news. And the United States will be more engaged again. The, the idea of North America is, is alive again. Um, Joe Biden has a pre-existing relationship with uh, our government in Canada, with our prime minister. That's a good thing. And he's well disposed toward Canada. And he's internationalist and looking for uh, partnering with other countries to solve global problems. All of that is to the good. Where I would issue a word of caution, though, to Canadians is in assuming that we've simply moved from the darkness to daylight and that all of the problems that we had under President Trump have somehow gone away. Um, the simple fact is that while the, the Republican Party today would be unrecognizable to uh, Ronald Reagan, who was the one of the fathers of, of NAFTA, uh, it does not mean that because President Trump has wrenched the Republican Party out of its traditional beliefs, that somehow the Democrats have abandoned theirs. Uh, it was historically the Republicans who were in favor of more open trade, open borders. It was historically the Democrats who were more protectionist. And uh, President-elect Biden has talked about uh, maintaining an America first policy. We shouldn't assume that we are going back to the status quo ante. There's a lot of work for us to do to, to build on relationships, but at least there will be an open door. Um, Mark Warner, I'll ask you to pick up from there. Uh, in your work as a as a trade lawyer, uh, how do you see the the evolving bilateral relationship? Well, I think that in, in some ways it's going to be uh, become easier for Canada. In some ways, it'll be harder. I think that um, the ways it'll become easier are the way, ways that I think Perrin has already signaled. We'll have a president who is at least favorably, more favorably dis, uh, dis, um, disposed to Canada and to um, international engagement. Um, the way that I think that um, it's going to become more complex is I think that we've kind of had a holiday for the last five years because we've had Darth Vader as the president. And so we haven't really had to do a lot of deep thinking about trade um, in terms of, you know, what what the Americans were really asking of us. I don't, you know, a lot of, and I think part of this is, is to the advantage of, of the current federal government. They took an approach, which was, if you give me Darth Vader, I'm going to work with Darth Vader domestically. It's a perfect target. It's a perfect enemy. I'll stoke people up. We'll have Team Canada. Everybody will side with us. The problem is, if you go down the list of the issues we've had with the Americans, there really weren't new. Softwood lumber, that's been around since some people say before there was a Canada. Uh, steel, aluminum tariffs, well, we've had them before. They weren't called national security tariffs, but we've sure had them before. Um, quotas, yeah, we've seen those. Um, WTO engagement, uh, we've had our suits with the Americans that they didn't follow through on, but note again, softwood lumber, and so we've had to go and negotiate um, bilateral agreements. So we've had this, you know, by American, well, we saw that last with the Obama, Biden in power with the great restructuring. Um, and I think when uh, the minister I worked for, Sandra Pupatello, who's also here, uh, had to deal with that as well as, as a lot of requests were made to Ontario because the Americans basically said, if Canada, you want to have a bilateral agreement for us and exclusion from infrastructure, your province there, that big province you have called Ontario, it's gonna to have to cough some stuff up for the first time in history. And we did. 
So we're not going to have that luxury anymore. We're not going to, it's not, we're going to have to actually engage in Canada in a discussion about free trade of a kind that we haven't really had to do. I think since frankly, the 1980s, when Perrin Beattie was in power with Brian Mulroney in the first go round, we, we, we've been able to have this discussion where the other guys are bad. The other guys are doing horrible things to us. And we're just sitting here as angels, you know, our markets are open, yada, yada, yada. And I think that's going to be a much harder sell, uh, in part because Joe Biden has a Congress is, uh, that, that, that will be protectionist. I think we can count on that. And um, if you look at what made him president, what they call the blue wall, well, the blue wall looks pretty much uh, close to the border of Canada. <laughs> and he's going to be owning a lot of those people. And we have some advantages there. We have trade union leaders who cross the border and the steel workers and that sort of thing. And uh, the auto people are not in the same union now, but they don't uh, hate each other, I don't think. <laughs> um, and so, uh, um, so there are some advantages, but I think we're going to have to have a more a complex conversation than we've had. And we'll get to it perhaps in the next segment, but I think China is going to be a flashpoint because I do think that um, elite opinion in Canada and business and government in academic circles, I, my sense does not really appreciate the extent to which on a bipartisan basis, the Americans have had it with China. And that will implicate our trade policy, our immigration policy, our research policy, and ways that I don't think we've completely understood. And in part, I would argue that's how we stumbled into the Huawei Meng Wanzhou extradition case in Vancouver, but we can come to that in the next segment. And indeed, we will be spending quite a bit of, of the next segment talking about uh, China. Um, uh, Senator Pupatello, what do you what do you make of this this big change, the election of um, uh, a, a Democratic Biden administration, and what are the opportunities and challenges that it opens up? Good afternoon, and thanks for having me, Paul. I I think. The best word for the moment is slow. I don't see that anything is going to change quickly. Uh, given the way the uh, election ended with uh, how many, you know, what level of power does Biden actually have to move through and placing cabinet uh, in a hurry? Uh, I think a lot of this is going to take more time. Uh, that's really good for Canada. It sort of lets us go back to, hmm, how many of these people do we know? How many did we used to work with? Um, and a lot of what Mark had said around issues that we experienced over the last many years, they are the same issue. I think the difference was that at least the Americans were being polite about it while they were trying to stick it to us in the neck. Um, because the last several years, I mean, he's just been savage. I don't even know if there's a better word for his behavior. And now I think it's, we're going from savage to stately, but I don't know that the topics will have changed much. I got to know Stockwell Day when he was our federal minister, frankly, on the Buy America issue. Uh, and that was right in the middle of a recession. It was very difficult for Canada at the time. And we did have an awful lot of stick handling to do. Uh, that issue was going to resurrect itself. I just think Biden will be slower to go about really exacting something that will hurt us. And a lot of that is because politically, he's got to get his group in place. And, and as we can see, Trump's behavior, all of this transition is going to take a little bit longer. Um, in addition, he's been very clear to say, look, it's America first. Uh, he's got to regroup. He's got to get his country back in order. So it sort of reminded me when you're on the airplane and they say, put your own oxygen mask first, then apply to the child. And I think it might be somewhat the same way. They've got to figure out where their angst is within their own country. And there's a lot of it that's been sort of brewing over many years. Um, and then they're going to start lifting their head up and saying, OK, now about these multilateral organizations that we pulled away from, let's start uh, seeping back in. And at that point, I think Canada has a great opportunity because probably we've been there all along. Um, one of the things I would advise if I were talking to the government and they were listening, I would say, Let's get Gerald Butts back working in Ottawa. Let's start going back to the relationships that we had in our first term in 2015, because those folks are back and they're in a much higher position to be influential with the Joe Biden group today. Um, that I, I, I think despite America being such a big country, in the end, it still comes down to relationships. Who knows whom? Who's worked with whom in the past? And Canada is very well placed to take advantage of that. Okay. 
Is it as though the Trump uh, administration never happened? Is it as though we're um, January 20th of, uh, of 2021 w will be like uh, what would have happened if, if um, Hillary Clinton had gotten elected four years ago? Or have the facts changed on the ground? Does the new, let me start with you, Mark. Does the new uh, Kusma uh, 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 change the relationship in ways that People whose muscle memory uh, dates back to NAFTA will 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 need to uh, learn about and 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 adjust to. So you know, Biden is putting his team together now, and it's interesting looking at the names that are the early signals that we can see from his foreign policy team and his economic team. Um, his foreign policy team looks very much like it's about you know the restoration of the king, right? As you see, people who were around the Obama administration around. John Kerry, State Department. Um, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury was actually the American point person on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, the Secretary of State, Blinken, has spoken very highly about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But it is almost impossible for me to see on a technical level how the United States could rejoin the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I just, I think it's very early days to see where he's going with this. What is he, what message is he really trying to send us? with these people who looked like they really were, you know, the courtiers of the last guy. Um, I think that Biden has to know that almost 75 million people voted for Trump for Trumpism. And that kind of technocratic internationalist, uh, they, you know, the version of the Americans when they talk about, when we talk about the Laurentian elite, the Americans talk about the Council on Foreign Relations. And if this is going to be the return of the Council on Foreign Relations presidency, the Democrats have been gone in four years. <laughs> I really don't think there's a market for that if you look at what's happened throughout this century the last, every time the Americans have gone to the polls, they've essentially elected someone who is an isolation in this century. We didn't, we don't, the last guy was so much of an isolation we forget what people thought of Obama in the capitals of Europe and in Asia. They didn't think he was an internationalist and he sure didn't think George W. Bush was either. So, um, so I think that I think we have to wait and see what they're what what how Biden actually builds out from this. I think a lot of it is going to be tonal and rhetorical. Um, he's going to try to talk to people, find points of engagement. But I think that the facts on the ground are as they are now. And um, we're, we're going to have to build out from that as opposed to sort of going right back to where we were before. And would I be right? Maybe I'll, I'll ask you this, Karen Beattie that to some extent, any talk about uh, a renewed Canada-U.S. relationship is provisional on simply reopening the border, which has been closed uh, since March. Is that the sort of uh, sine qua non of, 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 of getting back to normal? It, it's part of it, but it's not the most important part. Uh, the most important part is the relationships that we have and the attitude of the administration toward North America and toward, toward Canada and toward openness. Um, the reopening of the border will will take place when it's possible to do so. One of the surprising things, Paul, is how well supply chains have worked during all of these these lockdowns. So the border has functioned fairly seamlessly. Where we felt the impact is on individuals traveling much more than on uh, directly on on business. Just building for a sec on on what what Mark had said earlier, I, I think it's important for us to understand this is not the same country as it was back at the time of, uh, of uh, Barack Obama. I remember waking up uh, one morning, I was actually at our place in Florida, uh, waking up in a cold sweat and thinking, wait, what if, what if Donald Trump isn't an aberration? What if in fact he is representative of the American people? And you take a look at all of the issues in this election, the, the, the gross mishandling of COVID-19, for example, that would have killed any other uh, politician anywhere else in the world. And then just, we could all list all of those issues. Still, this was a remarkably close election. He represents a strain of thought within the United States, which is persistent and which will be there after he's gone. That means then that it isn't a, a restoration of the, uh, of the old regime. It's not a, a, a return to the status quo ante. Now, uh, this is a, a country that has been profoundly changed and Canada is going to have to adapt to that. And one of the areas, by the way, Paul, where, where we've got to play is Congress. We have uh, uh, two elections taking place in Georgia for, for Senate. 
if the Democrats pick those two off, they get control of the Senate. If they don't get the two of them, Republicans continue to control it, and you have a divided uh, a divided government. It's going to be very important for Canada to be present on the Hill as well. Okay. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, pipeline politics in particular and energy exports uh, a little more broadly, uh, both in questions that were submitted uh, ahead of time by participants and, and what we're seeing on the live chat. Um, so let's start. Uh, um, I'll ask you this first, Senator Pupatello. Um, the, the Keystone XL pipeline, which the Trudeau government uh, purports to support and which Biden has sing signaled he's, he will uh, 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 reverse the authorization for, um, is that a sign of difficulties to come on the energy file? I actually think it is. Uh, I worry about uh, Biden's very open positioning because for Biden, I think he's in a very difficult uh, spot where he needs to appease Republicans because he's committed to restoring balance and, and crossing the divide and being less divisive. So you've got to assume that there's going to be some give and take on issues here. At the same time, uh, the president-elect has to keep his sort of lefties of the party at, at bay somehow where they're going to start now pushing very hard on the new Green Deal. Um, what about the environment? Um, a big signal, in my view, was the appointment of John Kerry to the climate change agenda for the U.S. to say right up front, we're getting back into the Paris Accord. That alone bodes very well for Canada because it puts us back on an even keel. The difficulty when the EPA and the standards coming out of, say, California were driving the Americans under Obama to continue to put more and more regulation, Canada was in, in the sort of side in the sidecar saying, oh, geez, we need to keep up with this because it costs companies too much money to have different regulations. We need to be in sync. So I think, you know, so in the same way that him getting back on board with the Paris Accord on a climate change agenda somehow should be bringing us closer together on that front. But in very particular projects like Excel, which means a, a tremendous amount to Alberta, um, I worry that that somehow is going to be negotiated away. So it'll be a very clever thinking on how Canadians can put forward a case. Uh, is there a quid pro quo there that we can actually say, well, we're prepared to do this if you can let this move ahead. Um, and I think that, that there's got to be some tactical discussion going on right now in Ottawa to, to plan for that eventuality. Okay. Uh, Mark and Perrin on energy and the environment. It's, it, it's, it's probably a good idea to throw in uh, climate politics in with, uh, with energy politics. The uh, I, I just say on Keystone, you know, I know they always say, you know, kill, um, you know, kill all the lawyers or something like that. But, uh, um, you know, my, my feeling about Keystone is that it, 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 it's, it can't die. It's kind of like Monty Python, you know, and, you know, even if Biden comes in on the first day and issues an executive order like Trump reversing Trump's first day executive order, it'll still go to the courts. I mean, nobody's going to accept that as a result. It's going to go back a thousand times. And so the question is, as long as Alberta and the energy interests in Alberta are interested in keeping it alive, you know, maybe maybe it just has to survive four years and there'll be another Republican president. But I don't know at one point does Alberta basically say, no, we've had enough. Or, you know, they don't have a lot of options because as bad as Keystone is, they're getting, they seem to be having more success at Keystone than they do getting the pipeline across this country. So, you know, if you got, so if you're out, if you're, if you're a landlocked province like Alberta, where do you go? I just don't know. I mean, I, I think you have, they have no choice but to stick it out and play the litigation strategy out in the United States. I do think, um, you know, in terms of what Biden can do in terms of rejoining the Paris Agreement, you know, the Paris Agreement looks very different for, from my perspective than it does, I think, from, uh, from the way it's it, the attention it gets in the press. I mean, there's really not a lot that's binding there. It never, Obama never submitted it to the Senate for approval. Um, the, the, the things that are in there, you know, you know, they're just targets and, um, you know, Biden can sign up to them and, um, they're not all that enforceable, but it's good to have the United States in the room talking about these issues and it'll make it a little bit easier for other governments to make the necessary concessions that they have to, to bring their domestic populations along. Um, but I think people are going to be surprised by the extent to which it's hard for Biden to immediately reverse Trump 
on the environment in the same way that it took Trump almost two or three years to reverse Obama on the environment. It's just the way the American administrative processes work and how you have to get regulations through tends to be a lot more difficult. It's easier to you know, do that thing. Now, the real scary thing or the real interesting opportunity, and I don't know how Canada will react to this, there are a lot of American professors, not a lot, it's a small group of American professors who are now looking at the Trump experience with the Section 232 national security tax. And what they're beginning to say is, okay, so if Republicans want to use that for steel and aluminum, we didn't agree with that. But boy, if an American president really wanted to do stuff on the environment and invoke the national security emergency that, and use the power and not have to worry about Congress, there's an opportunity. And, there, and some of those people who have advocated that are on the advisory committees that Joe Biden has struck to advise him on policy. Now, I, as I say, I think some of these appointments are kind of symbolic and who knows what they really mean. But it's just interesting to keep in mind that there, that now that that genie has been taken out of the bottle, that there are other people who might want to use it. Okay. Well, my my sense is that pipeline politics are going to continue to be very difficult for for Canada. The the, the politics are are highly divisive. Uh, it's a case where any decision made on pipelines is driven not by environmental concerns but by political concerns. That's what happened with KXL first time out with with the U.S. And it's a case where Canadians pay the price and where an administration in the U.S. wanting to pay itself as green can kill off a pipeline and, and can uh, take measures against a Canadian initiative without paying the price. Uh, Sandra's in Newfoundland right now. It's not dissimilar from the, uh, from the uh, seal harvest, the fur trade, where the Europeans can be very moral on the issue of the fur trade um, because they don't, they're not, they don't have a seal harvest. And so they can kill it off in, in Canada. Same applies here. So I, I think if we're going to be successful, we're going to have to wrap it into something larger, a joint initiative that is more green and that deals with environmental issues at the same time. Uh, the good news from a competitive point of view for, for Canada is that for the last four years, we've had a U.S. administration that has been uh, rolling back environmental legislation and environmental regulation. And as a result, then, it's put Canada at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, by having a, an administration that will be much more engaged in uh, environmental initiatives and international initiatives, I think it'll level the playing field and will increase the possibility of Canada being able to work collaboratively with the U.S. and having coherent policies that extend across North America. Um, I have a bunch of other things I want to ask about this part of the conversation, but we, the schedule tells me that we need to move on uh, to a more global context. Um, uh, the, talk, the title I gave to this topic is Global Trade in an Evolving Global Economic Order. And obviously the main components of that are China, uh, Brexit, um, and uh, the substantial challenges that um, international institutions have come under over the last decade, and especially since 2016. Um, I guess we'll start with the first and the biggest of those, which is the U.S.-China trade relations. Um, is there any reason for optimism that the U.S.-China, and uh, we'll start with Senator Pupatello on this, is there any reason for optimism that the U.S.-China relationship will improve in the future? What are the implications for Canada's trade opportunities with China? And should the goal be engagement with China or containment, or is that a false uh, dichotomy? I worry the most about China, um, their impact uh, in terms of their relationship with the Americans, because that just by nature, uh, you know, when, when they're getting into a mud fight, the elbow comes our way. And uh, that's the frustration. We've seen that happen uh, recently, of course, over the last few years that we are now suffering the consequences. And uh, we're the one that walks away with the bloody eye and they just keep, you know, having their little battle. Um, it, it, so it's frustrating. I don't see anything coming to a head soon. I do think just like uh, Biden is going to try to bring the temperature down in America, let alone you know across all of these other international organizations, it's going to take a while. But ultimately, uh, he said one thing that I was very impressed with. He said, we need a coalition that China can't fight. Uh, we need to, and, and in using that language, he sort of connotes the idea that 
back to, it's not just about America, but it's America, Australia, Canada, who else in the world, Germany, that have had major issues. And if we band together with our, I don't want to say demands, but be, a beginning of a new type of conversation, uh, China would be very hard pressed not to listen. And, you know, I often try to sit and say, well, from China's perspective, what do they gain from it? Uh, my concern is that if we don't continue to engage with the balance of Asia, China is. And when you see the growth um, in the out years where it's largely in Asia, I mean, we're doing this sort of incremental growth. And then you see China by 10, 20 or the other Asian nations. So uh, that tells me a couple of things. A Canadian government with a very focused attention on the balance of Asia in terms of trade relationships, agreements, activity, missions, companies, uh, new companies, research, etc. Um, so that regardless of what happens of ch with China, we've got our foothold in another very high growth world region. Um, and then really encourage the president of the United States to say, we want to be part of your coalition in this discussion. Canada on its own uh, just can't shake the, the fence uh, hard enough. And I'm, I'm a bit emboldened by that. That kind of language appeals to me because I actually think that could work. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, Sandra describes a, a, a Canada that is focused and ambitious in Asia. And I actually don't remember the last time this government was focused and ambitious on any foreign policy goal and, and, and even any trade goal. They, they just got TPPIP over the line, uh, um, kind of an ex exploration of a free trade deal with China collapsed under the weight of its contradictions. Um, Mark, is, uh, is Asia more, more broadly, China, but Asia more broadly, uh, still a terrain of opportunity or, 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 or you know, is it, uh, is it don't go there land? Um, I think it's an opportunity. I mean, it is an opportunity, but it, it, it's something that's going to take a lot of effort and work. I mean, the, 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 the benefit and the curse of Canada is, is geography. We're right, we're sitting right next to the United States and it's always going to be easier for someone to, who speaks English, who understands essentially common law contracting. We may not always love American courts, but it's familiar to us. Uh, and if you're going to sort of get up and try to sell and go to um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia or something, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and, you know, so it, it, and, and the Canadian companies that have been successful, like Manulife, uh, one that comes to mind, has been over in China and in Asia and in Southeast Asia for a long time. And I don't know whether we have those kind of, uh, you know, a lot of business people who are willing to put that kind of effort in, but that's the kind of intensity we take. I remember, and some time ago now, I was in Cambodia, I can't remember exactly when, maybe 2013, I was happy to be over there doing some advising for the government um, at the time. And, um, and uh, the ASEAN summit was there, which was really quite interesting because um, Cambodia, I don't know if you've ever been, but the country is interesting because they, um, they really, every Cambodian can tell you the exact number of bombs the Americans dropped on Cambodia. It's really quite striking. And uh, it's, just, it's just one of those things that they'll let you know. And I remember seeing the motorcade when uh, Xi Jinping came into town. And it, let's just say, swamped the motorcade for Barack Obama. As popular as Barack Obama was around the world, he was not very popular. People would say, you know how many bombs they dropped on Cambodia? Um, and when I asked about Canada, the people, the response I got from the ASEAN people, now, we're, we're, now we've got some kind of observer status in ASEAN. But at the time, the response I thought was quite interesting. People said, we don't know what to do with Canada. You know, Canada's in, Canada's out. It's here one year, it's gone the next year. We don't see a sustained interest in our part of the world. And I don't know whether that's changed in seven years or not, but it's that kind of sustained effort that we have to make. And it, it means being on the ground, being present there for not just for summits, uh, means being present there for their own initiatives that they want, um, not showing up to sell one product that we're particularly good at, we want to sell. It's, it, it's going to take much more of a sustained effort um, than I think we've, we've been prepared to make um, up to this point. And um, so that's my thought on that. I can come back to China later, but I'd be interested in hearing what Perrin has to think at this point as well. How about that, Perrin? 
Um, the real question for there's great opportunity for us. We're the one country that has a trade agreement for North America, for Europe, and for uh, CPTPP as well. That, that's a great advantage. But we have not been. We're great at negotiating these things. We are not so great in terms of uh, of acting on them after they're in place and taking advantage of them. And we need to be very focused on that. At the governmental level, uh, there. The question for us here is the same as it was earlier this week on the fall economic statement. Would the government focus on the main event, which is the economic uh, activity, or would they be distracted by side issues, which are essential, essentially social uh, social policy? That was the problem with CPTPP, where things went off the rails in, in, uh, in Vietnam in the final negotiations. And it was the problem when uh, the government went to Beijing and thought that they could change domestic Chinese policy to get a trade agreement with Canada, which is a population slightly larger than Shanghai's. Um, if we are focused on the need to enhance trade and uh, to not just sign agreements, but to execute on them and to move ahead, I think we can make su substantial process, progress here. Um, it is a fundamentally changed environment though in which we're operating. Now, uh, we are not returning to the old liberal order of internationalism, of free trade, of, uh, of open borders, and so on. The United States will not be the sort of engine for, for uh, open trade that it was back under Reagan and, and under the Bushes. And as a consequence, then it's going to, be, going to be tougher to achieve than it was before. But Canada has a direct interest in ensuring open borders and open trade and ensuring that that international institutions like the World Trade Organization can succeed. The good news with the change in administrations in the U.S. is at least you have a, uh, an administration there that is looking for partners, that sees Canada as a potential partner, and that believes in internationalism. Okay. In that context, is there, is there a role that Canada can play to influence a more stable global trade order? Uh, or is the momentum in, in favor of that idea simply simply seeping away. I mean, you know, Christopher Freeland would talk all the time about uh, the rules-based international order, and, and, and I, I sometimes had the impression that that was a phrase that meant less every time she used it, through no fault of hers or anyone else in the Canadian government, that the rules-based international order is simply falling out of fashion. Uh, is can, can Canada alone or with uh, allies reverse that trend? So, yeah. yeah, I would just say, uh, first of all, what happened in, in America in the last few years also was shocking to Americans and to American leadership at the state and federal level where they weren't necessarily even wanted to, they, we didn't even want to invite them to parties anymore. So on a very personal level, I think Americans had to say, wow, they're, they're, they've shut our board, they shut their border to us. Uh, the pandemic, I think, uh, sort of crank that up at several notches by saying, well, Americans can't fly here anymore. I mean, when has that ever happened in American history that they can recall? Uh, so while we're sort of licking our wounds after the battles with the savage in the White House, um, Americans have to also say, oh my goodness, we've got to do some work here to regain this international trust so that when we say something, we actually mean it. I mean, imagine... Um, any diplomat working with uh, an American colleague after the Kiev fiasco, would you do you trust the diplomats that are coming out of the U.S. anymore? Uh, just because you had a change of president, that doesn't automatically say everyone's turned the page. Uh, people are very uncomfortable with the knowledge that Trump was prepared to scoop our PPE supply during the pandemic, going against all of these con contractual obligations that these companies had to ship us product to Canada. Um, so that is a sting that is or, or a wound that, that runs deep. You don't just get over that because you have a new president. And I think the Americans to some degree realize they've got some heavy lifting too. So while we need to re-engage, see who these new people are, um, the same is true for all of them, the Americans, the, how they engage with the Germans, the Japanese, etc. cetera. Um, I think Many who have a lot to do with our economy, when you realize uh, the UK, let's give our government some credit, they just signed, no details yet, the accord with the UK. Um, and that is, you know, 
with Brexit going on, uh, the UK's now realized, gosh, I guess we've got to get some deals here. And that's important to Canada. Uh, the UK is our biggest trading of that block. We do a lot of business with the UK, so that's important to us. So I think while the pandemic's taken all the front pages, all of the columnists stories, uh, no one is spending a lot of time for some heavy lifting that's been going on. Uh, there's a trade mission being organized now to Taiwan. Uh, there was just one with Korea. Things that maybe are not well known, but are happening. So the idea that let's engage the balance of Asia, I think it can be done. We have a lot of business with Japan, with Korea, lots of investment from major Korean companies that we don't even recognize are actually Korean. Um, so it's not all bad. Uh, to some degree, the American you know, the debacle of four years with that administration meant we had to look up and say, OK, uh, we really do have to focus on other parts of the world. So some of it's a hard lesson that I think we've taken advantage of and we are now moving on, uh, not just this current government, but the one previous as well. OK, Mark, I know you wanted to jump in on this. The, um, the, 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 the notion that sort of international cooperation is, is simply falling out of fashion. Um, although at the same time, global supply chains, as we found out during COVID, can be really hard to inflect that they're, 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 they're deeply uh, entrenched in practice, if not in theory. Right. So I think the, one of the questions for the world community is going to have to face, uh, I think, uh, in Europe and Canada and elsewhere, is what, are, what is the world prepared to give to get the Americans to re-engage with the international system? If you go back to the post cold World War II era, the deal was the Americans had the strongest army. They were going to rebuild Europe by creating the OECD. And then that sort of fallout from that became the European Union through the creation of the uh, European Coal and Steel community, which then led to the, with the European Union. And then they underwrote this liberal order of multilateralism that was essentially going to do what the Americans wanted it to do. And that was kind of the deal. Um, and countries like Canada, who were middle powers, were honest brokers because, more or less, we came alongside the Americans. Even in times like the Vietnam War, eh, had a kind of controversial prime minister, but we never cut the supply chains to the American military as well. We kept that going throughout the Vietnam War. So the issue for the international community is going to be when the Americans, when Biden comes back, this last great internationalist and says, I want to come back to the WTO, but you can't be the same thing you had before. I'm not going to agree to an appellate body that gets in and rewrites all of our trade laws. What are we going to do? Are we going to stomp our feet and say, no, 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 you agreed to it before and you're going to have to muscle under and it's a new world order? Or are we prepared to engage? Like, what's that price that Europe and Canada, even? I don't know where it is because if the deal is to the Americans, you have to recognize that you're no longer the most important country in the world. And you now come as just one among sort of equal, one sort of equal party alongside everybody else. You got to be prepared for the idea that the Americans might say, well, we're still the world's largest economy. If that's the price of engagement, you know what? We'll just stay at home. And there, I think 75 million votes tell you that there's a pretty high constituency for that. So I, I think that that's going to be the tough question. So whether it's the WTO or the Iran nuclear deal or whatever it is, I think the world's going to have to find out what does it mean? So let's come back to China now. Let's come back and, and ask that question. So, OK, the Americans say, let's put together an, an, a group of allies to confront China on critical minerals. OK, so where who's investing in the Canadian mining sector? We've got this Investment Canada review. On a, on, a, on a mine, a gold mine in Nunavut. Not that gold is particularly critical, but it is in the Arctic Circle or close to it. What are we going to do when we have all of these Chinese state-owned enterprises essentially providing the capital to fuel our mining industry? The tension for Canada is going to be, okay, you, yeah, you want to be part of the team, United's Team America allies to confront China, but now you're basically allowing the Chinese to buy everything that's significant. And at some point, Canada's going to have to figure this out. Which which side are you going to be on? Because I don't think you're going to be able, with even under a President Biden, I don't think Canada's going to be able to make that work. 
right? To say, we're going to be part of Team America to confront China as we basically open the entire economy to China and um, in a significant way. And, and that's going to require, I think, a lot deeper thinking and a lot more strategic thinking in Canada than we've seen, we've seen before. Um, you're beginning to see similar kind of conversations in Germany when they confront it, because of course the Germans have provided the engine of the sort of Chinese economy by selling them all the advanced manufacturing tools that they needed. And now the Germans have woken up and realized, oh my God, we're now competing with China for advanced manufacturing. And they're beginning to sort of figure it out, well, maybe we do have more in common with those American perspectives on China. And you're, but I don't, I don't have a sense of the, that that kind of conversation has come to Canada just yet. Okay. Let me close Hold this. Up. I want to put one final question to you, Perrin. It's one that just came up in the chat, but it, 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 I think maybe ties a lot of this together. One of the people in the audience has asked, is there any possibility for Canada, and especially Ontario, to come back at least partly to manufacturing significance? All the talk of reshoring that we, you know, when, when, when we suddenly realized we didn't have a lot of masks lying around in March, um, that led to half a year of discussing whether these global supply chains are the best, uh, are the best uh, solution and, and a lot of speculation about the possibility of reversing those trends. Is it only speculation? Is it possible? I, I think it's largely speculation. I, I think we'll see some of this taking place. So we saw pandemic protectionism. In a lot of countries, over 75 countries put on export controls during the pandemic. And that suggests to Canada that we have to ask ourselves from a national security point of view, are there elements of our manufacturing that to protect our, our, our security in Canada, uh, in this case, our health security, we have to, to be able to supply here, whether in Canada itself or in North America, it could be nearshoring as opposed to uh, bringing it entirely onshore. But uh, what we're seeing around the world is a move away from the liberal international order that we saw before. We're seeing increasing movement uh, globally, and it, it predated Trump to some extent. It certainly predated the, the pandemic, but it was accelerated by it, where, where societies are divided between open and closed societies, between those societies which see the rest of the world and their engagement with it as an advantage versus seeing that as a threat. And I think we're going to be finding that, that global trade will become more difficult. That will mean that Canadian companies will have to be asking themselves, uh, first of all, how do I diversify my sources uh, if there's another pandemic and it shuts down uh, production in China where I'm looking to source from? Uh, do I have other sources that I can get it from uh, either in other parts of the world or in America? Secondly, should I be building stockpiles? In case, of, uh, in case of a shutdown? Or third, should I be bringing production home entirely and trying to, to uh, develop it here? Um, and you'll see a mixture, I think, of responses. Uh, the, other, the, the other question I would put to the questioner, if you like, is when you refer to manufacturing, are you talking about physical assembly or are you talking about the components of manufacturing, such as the intellectual property? Uh, there's enormous potential for Canada there, and uh, we should be focusing on innovation in Canada and on building our strengths in, in that area. Whether or not uh, we're uh, in all areas of assembly going to be competitive with the cheapest areas in the world uh, is a debate we can have. But in other elements of, uh, of manufacturing, absolutely, we can bring it home and be successful in Canada with the right policies. Okay. Um so this takes us into the third um, general subject area, uh, which is uh, going, where we're going to try and be more prescriptive. The title I gave it is Keys to Canadian Success in a New Era. The question essentially is what, is, what should Canadian governments, what should Canadian firms be doing to maintain or increase their edge in uh, in this brave new world. Um, and uh, one of the first questions that we had uh, knocked about as we prepared for this is, what are some of the key challenges that Canada faces in improving its competitiveness? And you can discuss this either from an economy-wide perspective or focus on a couple of key industries so that it can be more effect so it can more effectively realize the benefits of trade. Senator Pupatello, who always represented a border community in, in, in the provincial parliament, uh, I, I think these kinds of questions just are just wired into your 
into your psyche. So I'll ask you, if you were advising uh, the Ontario or federal government or advising a large client, what would you be telling them to do uh, as we get ready for 2021? Well, it's a different question if you're speaking to the government or if you're speaking to industry. Um, what is shocking to me is that when I was Minister for Ontario, we used to watch the FDI report, and I used to sort of carry that magazine around and see Ontario's number one again in all the North American jurisdictions, number one in FDI this year. And, and we'd wear that like a badge of honor. Canada's a trading nation. It's that That's as it should be. It will continue. We're too small to be anything other. But what's shocking today is that I'm not competing against Mississippi or Alabama like we were before in manufacturing and landing uh, auto investment. We're competing with the entire country of China, uh, other jurisdictions in Asia, um, and they are now big enough to insist on localizing manufacturing. And just according to sales, that once they're hitting that you know million mark of a vehicle, they say, you know what, this needs to be in market. And they will be around a type of government that can insist that business do that. And the OEMs of the original manufacturers are actually listening. So where does that leave Ontario, for example? Automotive is in our blood. It's a big factor of our benefit in Ontario. Um, our companies need to be investing where those original manufacturers are being placed. And that currently is not in Canada. I will tell you, the minute Biden was, uh, so we got the inkling he was winning, you'll notice we had two really big investment announcements in Canada for automotive. Ford with their uh, new electric engines, et cetera, thankfully in my hometown at the uh, engine plant, uh, as well as in Oakville. Um, and just recently, the GM truck plant to be reopened in Oshawa. Now that interestingly happened when they knew Trump was looking in the rear view mirror, not, not forward. Um, so he sort of wasn't able to give him the back of his hand. So what, no matter when it happened, they did it for a reason, because Canada doesn't align as the least expensive place to do business. So there are other factors that says Canada is a good place to invest. And in manufacturing, that's heavy capital investment. It's not like other types of business that has a very light load. Um, it's a big deal because it's they're in for the long the long haul. So it can be done, and in my opinion, should be done. So why doesn't Canada do what no other country is talking about today, and that is become even more competitive on the tax front to be a, a competitive tax jurisdiction? Uh, we had the benefit of going into the pandemic with a better debt ratio than most countries. And all countries are spending like crazy to help their population get out of the pandemic. Imagine if we're going to be the only story that in the same breath becomes very aggressive to gain investors to come back to Canada, obviously post pandemic, but that could be 2021. So, you know, I'd like to be a bit of a, uh, of a hawk on that and say, we can do it. There will be companies who are looking for opportunities because the M&A world now is saying, where there are weak companies that may not survive, this is a good opportunity for strong companies. And uh, you know what can Canada do about that? So I believe in all of this, there are opportunities and we've got some great Canadian stories uh, that are international and they're already in these markets that Mark and, and Karen mentioned. Um, and, and we should use them as an example. Um, that's an interesting perspective that uh, connects uh, two events that I hadn't thought of in the in, in, at the time, which is closing that GM plant in Oshawa essentially is is a, is a is a major American corporation saying Trump is here to stay, or Trumpism is here to stay, and re and unclosing that plant essentially is 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 uh, uh, saying well maybe it's not here to stay, maybe this uh, this uh, supply chain that we've had for all of our lives is is sturdy and and, and likely to last. Um, uh, Perrin, do you buy that? And, and then back to the more general question, what should firms and, and governments be doing to get ready for 2021? There's an element to, to which business in the U.S. is going to be looking at the change in administrations and realize they're not going to be punished by making rational for making rational business decisions. Um, it didn't matter what there was on paper in COSMA or NAFTA or any bilateral agreement. The president of the United States was calling up CEOs and saying, you put your investment somewhere else and it's going to cost you big time. Um, so there was a very real penalty to be paid. At least people will be able to make, make more rational decisions. 
Um, I think it's important. I, I fully subscribe to what Sandra said, but I think it's important for to realize that, that Canada's picture on investment wasn't good in February before uh, before the pandemic struck. And going back to the status quo ante isn't good enough. We've got to look at how do we come ahead. Every country in the world is going to be looking at how does it attract investment? How does it restart its economy? What's going to be absolutely critical for us is to be to be extremely focused on what we can do to bring investment to Canada and to encourage companies that this is a, a, an environment which is attractive for them to come. Um, we have hammered the energy sector in, in Western Canada is a case in point where we're, we're the best in the world in terms of what we do. Yet we have made it so unwelcoming for people to come to Canada to invest in that sector that pe the companies have pulled their money out. Um, we need to focus on, on how do we make this a welcoming environment. Uh, Sandra men mentioned uh, tax and other areas, regulatory uh, burden on, on business. Third is just the political messaging that we have in terms of, of welcoming uh, FDI in Canada and encouraging investment and having uh, business-centered policies. Um, we have all of the potential. We're the most fortunate people anywhere in the world. Uh, we have double resources. We have a history of stable government. We have a superb educational system. We have people with a strong work, work ethic, yet we're performing below potential uh, with the right policies we can we can uh, resume growth in Canada, make ourselves an attractive place to invest. Okay, I want to stay with you for a second, Perrin, because um, the, the the idea that we weren't doing well already on investment. I mean, the the whole selling proposition of of, of this government in the early years of uh, Trudeau's term in, in, in office was that Canada was already a very attractive place to invest and could only become more so uh, with a few nudges. It, you've got a highly educated workforce. You've got political stability over the long term, uh, regardless of party in power. You've got um, uh, uh, a, a, an economy that intends to be ever greener and therefore uh, more attractive um, both to companies in that sector and to companies in general. And then things like the talent visas, um, the, the whole goal of that was to um, essentially uh, mow the Americans' lawn to be, be to be and to become a more uh, attractive place to invest and to build a family than the United States for those workers who had a choice. Uh, w w were the premises of that assertion and that that um, uh, you know claim uh, unfounded or exaggerated or? If we're talking specifically about the U.S., for all of the things that Trump did wrong, what he did do was to create a business environment that was very attractive to people to invest and to create new jobs in the United States. And as a result, then it sucked in investment from the rest from the rest of the world, and it made it much more difficult for Canada as we were adding to the tax and regulatory burden on on businesses here to be able to compete with with the U.S., where the economy was literally on on fire. Where we have, where we had, and where we, I believe, will continue to have a competitive advantage is on people. Uh, U.S. immigration policies have been a gift to Canada. And one of the things, Paul, that, that we should be doing uh, is to, to be going down, meeting with American businesses and saying to them, if you're having difficulty finding the talent that you need, if you'll put an R&D facility anywhere in Canada, we'll guarantee that we'll either find you a Canadian or that we we will bring in somebody from abroad to be able to uh, to fill that that role. Um, there's a great opportunity for us because of bad policies elsewhere, as doors close in the United States or in Europe or elsewhere. Wonderful opportunity for us to to bring to bring the best and the brightest to Canada. And when you do that, jobs and investment come with it. Okay. Yeah, Paul, if I may, just uh, from my experience, the. Uh... The, the tax incentives aren't necessarily around corporate tax, because I always think that's a function of great accountants, but things like the R&D tax environment and the credits available um, made Canada very attractive to, to lots of companies who would take, like Cisco, you know, big American firms would place their bet. Um, we included a whole bunch of expenses under R&D that weren't included in the U.S., and it was a big benefit to Canada to do so. And like Perrin was saying, when we get those high-enders, if you will, these are individuals, they're not in the 
100,000 range, they're in the 200, 250,000 range. Um, that's the kind of employment that we're always chasing and has that spin off. If you look at Waterloo today, if you look at my hometown and the people that are working from Windsor who cross every day uh, with a little bit more difficulty these days, obviously, to go into Auburn Hills, uh, the, the tech centers that are right there in Michigan, um, those are people that are built in Canada. And um, so I think that is a big advantage. Um, when we talk about FDI and what we're chasing, we do chase a different kind of investment today from what we would have done 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, it isn't the uh, what you would call a lower level manufacturing job because we know on some of those uh, key expenses, we're not competitive. Um, so I think we're smarter about what we chase. And so I just go back to the point that it'd be interesting today to unveil a very aggressive global plan to start chasing business right on the heels of a pandemic, frankly. I think we should just do it. Okay. Mark Warner, what, what to you would the elements of that aggressive plan to uh, chase global investment, what would that look like? I think it would have to, I think the, the word that I would come to is coherence, policy coherence, because I think what we've been very good at is talking about all the things we can do and would like to do, but then joining them all up, that's where we kind of make a mistake. So the case in point will be electric vehicles. Great. We want to build the supply chain even better. Well, what are we doing to facilitate mining of lithium and cobalt? What kind of environmental regulations? Because that's where it is. I mean, that's if you want to build that supply chain for the electric vehicle and have the complete supply chain. You've got to really have policies that promote all of it, really. I mean, because that's our advantage, right? Our advantage is we can actually say we, if you could actually get it done and have, you could actually have someone come here and say, I want to build a battery because we've got really smart people in Waterloo who can design you the best battery and we can actually provide you, we can mine that lithium and that cobalt. And by the way, we've got some of those uh, rare earths that you're getting from China or somewhere else. We can get those from Alberta and from none of it but we've got to have a policy that's coherent, right? You can't have policies that say, we're going to make a park. You know, all that's all that rare earth that you've got up there in Alberta and in the Nunavut or whatever, it's going to be a national park and there's going to be no mining of it, no processing of it. You know? So we have all of these things that we could do. We have to actually figure out that we want to do them in a coherent way. And that's the part I don't hear, not to be partisan. I don't hear that from this government. I hear, a lot of stuff about the environment and carbon policies. I hear a lot of stuff about electric vehicles, but joining it all up, I'm not really hearing that. And on the um, immigration front, I think also, I guess what I would say, because I'm a bit of a contrarian, I don't know if Mahmoud has joined us on the, uh, on the on this call yet, as you think he wanted me to be a bit of a contrarian, but um, look, um, part of it is we're gonna have to have more honest discussions with ourselves, right? So the the immigration conversation in the United States around, let's just say, H-1B visas is basically a conversation where Americans have said, and Democrats and, and Trump together have said, why are we bringing in all these low-level people who are taking jobs from Americans, from other minorities, other whatever? And they're saying, we're going to basically make a requirement that if you want to come in under an H-1B temporary worker, you're not going to come in to work for um, a call center or for a, 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 what do you call those, um, you know, employment service companies, you're going to come in with a master's degree and above. So one of the things I have when I read these start articles, it seems like the Bloomberg newspaper chain seems to be doing these. Canada has got this advantageous immigration policy relative to the United States. And every time I see these articles, I think that's great product placement, whoever's getting them to write that. But why would we want to have people with less than a master's degree coming to Canada? Those are the people who are getting rejected from the United States. It's, it's not the PhDs. It's not the people who are the high end. Right? Mark, Mark, I just have to interject here for a second because I need to fact check. Okay. I want to call All right. Daniel Dale or something on CNN. <laughs> I fact check you. Okay, okay. Between Canada's uh, world-renowned refugee system and Canada's immigration system. Right. And if you could try to be uh, an individual with little education, little skill set, no papers, no trade, and try to come in, you won't. 
uh, and, and Windsor, who has a huge number of immigrants that come in every year through all kinds of means, um, we live this every day. It is very difficult to get into Canada without that level of skill set, education, etc. We do have a point system. Ours is the system that the Americans are trying to emulate. And uh, so, although I, I, I respect uh, you, and I, I used to love arguing with you, actually, when we were doing <laughs> this together, but you're just wrong on that point. No, no, no. We're not disagreeing. We're actually not disagreeing. I, and, I, I actually agree with that. I actually agree with you. So we're not disagreeing on that. In my I, view, we have too tough a system because yeah. every time an immigrant comes in, even the ones who don't have papers or not a carpenter or trade, they come here and they look for work. And there are people that we we can't find people to hire sometimes. Uh, so, you know, I'm almost the other side of this discussion where I think we should blow open the doors. Every immigrant brings tens of thousands of dollars into our economy and we need it. And we need lots of young families because we're not generating our own here. Right. No, I, know, I don't disagree. All I'm trying to say is that the interesting question for the tech sector, for Silicon Valley, and this is the part that I think people miss, is that what Americans are saying is, why are we bringing in all of these Indian IT workers, the we from from India essentially, who dominate the H-1B class? And they're saying, well, let's make sure the people we're bringing have master's degrees and above. So if, if Canada's gonna be the spot that says, hi, you know, you're running an outsourcing service, why don't you bring your outsourcing service to 905? That doesn't make any sense. Because it means the Americans, and this I think is really important, the Americans still want immigrants, they just want higher end immigrants. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. And I think if we get ourselves in the position where we're saying, oh, all of those people with their BAs from universities no one's ever heard of, we're gonna come, that, that you're not taking in the United States on your H-1B program, welcome to Canada so we can do an outsourcing plant in 905. That's crazy. And I think we're, so I think we have to ask ourselves, what should we be looking for if we wanna compete for that high end work? And by the way, yeah, there's no I, point graduating people from George Brown and Ryerson, sorry, one last quick point. There's no point graduating people from George Brown and Ryerson to have, who can't find a job and then we're going to import people from another country to do the jobs that we've just trained them for. I'm just we telling you, Mark, those people aren't getting in. They want to get in, but they're not getting okay. in. Okay. So we just need to be clear here because they're we not need to tell that, We need to tell that to Bloomberg then because that's not what Bloomberg's writing every week. Yeah, I'll just tell Dan, Daniel Dale to give him a call. I'll pass, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will get a memo to both of them. Karen, I'll give you the last word on this panel. I, well, I suspect you the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my pitch is this, that we have an un unprecedented opportunity in Canada to get the sort of people that Mark is talking about. We can see it already in our universities. If you look at the grade point averages of international students looking at applying to Canadian universities, they're considerably higher than they used to be. Why? Because doors in the rest of the world are closing, because people are being made feel unwelcome. This is an opportunity for us. We dare not miss this opportunity. We should be systematic going around the world and looking for the best and brightest and saying, if you want to build a better future, come to Canada, help us build our, our country. That's how our country was created. That's where our prosperity has come from. And there's enormous opportunity for the future, but we can't count on bad public policy elsewhere to exist indefinitely. We need to get moving on it now. Um, I wonder whether I've got time for one more question. Well, let me give it a shot. What we saw four years ago with the election of Donald Trump was an unprecedented retooling of the organization of the central government in Ottawa. You had a cabinet shuffle. Stephanie Dion was quietly ushered out the door and, and, and Christian Freeland became the foreign minister. You had the uh, creation of a quite a robust war room capacity uh, in the Privy Council office to keep an eye on what the president and his administration were doing. You had a, a huge activation of pro-Canada networks across the United States so that uh, state governors, every state governor knew how much of their uh, exports were going to Canadian markets. Uh, every uh, chamber of commerce was getting visited by a provincial premier or a cabinet minister. Um, what, let's assume that this government is going to take the Christmas break to come up with a similar adjustment, uh, w with an eye to, uh, uh, working with the new administration. What's the one thing you would advocate that, uh, should be a part of that, uh, government reshaping for a, for a, for a new period in the, in the most important relationship that we have? 
uh, start with Santa Cruz Hotel. Yeah, I would say first get uh, get all those folks back on our Christmas card list uh, and start to start reaching out to them right now. Uh, reach out to all the potential cabinet uh, members, whether they get passed through through or not. Um, and, and let's start reshaping those briefing notes, because I think that is the kind of work that has to go on regardless. So that was a big lesson, I think, for Canada not to take uh, for granted these relationships and that a local governor actually knows in the back pocket just how vital Canada is to their economy. Uh, you know, and having been involved with some of the companies that have big investments in these states, those state folks need to know just how vital Canadian companies are too, not just government uh, or just the relationship. So I think we need to sort of dust ourselves off. I'll bet that what we hear is, oh my God, please don't worry. Uh, we're good. We've got bigger fish to fry. We got to worry about North Korea, uh, China. And I think if they have to hear NAFTA 2.0 one more time, they might go jump off the ambassador bridge. Uh, they, they've had enough of it. Uh, I actually think that they may tell us that so we can settle down and realize, okay, so when time is right, uh, some of the big key items, I think, will be how long before Joe Biden comes to visit Ottawa. Because uh, remember, Trump never set foot, I think, across the border, or he did once in Quebec, maybe, because he was forced to. Um, some of those little telling signs so that we know we're back on track, I think, are going to be important. So I would start that invitation to some key items that are very that are very public and are noticeable uh, to show the world that we're back on track with our best buds. Okay, I thought that was the really good answer, and I thought it was a fantastic question. But I'm not going to let anyone else answer it because uh, I am the most I am the most relaxed moderator in the world until I have to bring the the show in for a landing, and uh -huh. my schedule tells me it is time for me to be thanking everyone, and and so on that note. Um, uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Lawrence National Center and the Ivy Academy for organizing uh, this uh, conversation. I hope the first of many. I want to thank our excellent panel, Mark Warner, Perrin Beattie, uh, Sandra Cupatello, for uh, being so frank and uh, and uh, not afraid to uh, uh, get into a bit of a dust up when, when, when the conversation needed it. Uh, we've benefited hugely from your uh, thoughts. And I want to thank the still really substantial audience that is watching us at home uh, and uh, who uh, made the uh, chat board really quite active while we were talking. You were carrying on a pretty good debate among yourselves. And I, I enjoyed uh, keeping an eye on that. Uh, Paul, I think uh, we're all good. And the, the comment from the Ivy alumni uh, Ottawa chapter was that, you know, this was a fantastic collaboration. And we look forward to more of these in the in our coming future. Okay. On that note, thanks everyone for joining us, and we'll see you again real soon. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>